Hey you guys, my name is Laszlo, you are watching DMB's channel and today we are talking about Hungarian folk art. In case you couldn't tell from the suspicious accent or the rambunctious facial hair already, Hungary is the country where I'm from. Therefore it is a design style that is obviously near and dear to my heart. Traditional Eastern European folk art and its history is a complex beast of a subject that I wanted to do some serious research on for some time now. And you know what, I just saw that after about four years of doing this with Jacqueline, driving this channel, putting out over 150 videos about art, design and all things creative, it's almost somewhat weird that in not a single one of them I say anything in Hungarian. So what are you to do, Barátaim? Let's start with a little bit of Hungarian history, just a bit of context so everyone is in the picture. There is quite a bit of mystique and intrigue around where did the Hungarians originally come from? Our linguistic and genetic differences set us apart from our neighboring countries and in fact from most other nations in Europe. Now to explain this anomaly, this uniqueness, the most commonly accepted theory is that the story of Hungarian people actually started in Central Asia, somewhere between the 5th and the 8th centuries BC. The early history of the Hungarian people involved hundreds of years of migrations, peaceful and not so peaceful interactions with other ethnic groups along the way, the most significant of these being the migration westward towards the heart of Europe, a military campaign that took place in the 9th century and eventually led the wandering Hungarian tribes to settle within the basin of the Carpathian mountains, where you would find modern day Hungary today. Now I'm telling you all this because looking at the artworks we will touch on this video, you would find that these early settlers brought a very eclectic blend of cultural influences with them. Asian, Turkic, finno agric heritage, amongst many others, all of which have somewhat contributed to the distinctive look and feel of Hungarian folk art. Now about the artwork itself, these signature classic floral motifs can be found all over my little home country. These distinctive shapes were the main forms of traditional pre-industrialized decoration and mark making in things like embroidery, pottery, wood carving, furniture painting, everything really. These basic shapes and forms seem simple enough at first glance, but as soon as you start giving them an analytic look, you will find that the system of which these patterns have been built on can become incredibly rich and overwhelmingly complex, even if we just take a quick look at the most well-documented embroidery styles that are prominent in different regions of the country, there are dozens of distinctive looks which we can tell apart. What makes analyzing difficult is the obvious cross-referencing in between the counties and territories from which the different styles originate and by the way usually get their names from, but if you look a little bit closer you will find that pretty much all the named design styles have some key distinctions to them. For example, if we take a look at the Palots territory signature design style, the Palots region being this bit in the northeastern part of the country, you'll see how this two-tone red and indigo blue color scheme is dominant in the style and these classic poppy resembling flower shapes are recurring elements that create a signature look. While if we observe another part of the country, let's say the Rabakuzi style, Rabakuz being on the very western part of Hungary, now this style tends to be monotone colored. Usually red, but not always, and unlike the Palot style, here we don't really see shapes fully filled in with color. Instead the style builds its imagery using line art predominantly. Now if you have ever been to Hungary or you have Hungarian relatives or friends, chances are you have come across with the two main internationally known decoration styles that we have. You might not know them by name, but these typical, very common, overused and souvenir type trinket styles are the macho and kalocsai ways of decorating. Macho land is here, Kalocsa is down here, and while the two art styles do have a lot in common, there are some key distinctions between them. The general rule of thumb is, if the composition you're looking at is built on a set of relatively modest, simple, geometrical shapes like circles, lines and whatnot, it's probably a macho design. While if the composition is a bit more complex, using a wider array of shapes and colors, then it's probably from Kalocha. In macho embroidery, the main peony rose motif can only be red for example, while the Kalocha style permits much more artistic freedom. New Kalocha inspired designs allow 
showing wildflowers for example, or just more realistic looking flowers, which go beyond the usual basic geometrically simplified motifs. This is down to the fact that the Macho style is much older, therefore much more traditional, while the Kalochai art style is a bit more modern, therefore it allows itself to be a little bit more experimental. Now for this next chapter I really want to dive into the symbolism behind Hungarian folk art a little bit. As you familiarize yourself with these styles and their recurring patterns, you might start to wonder where do these symbols actually come from? and what meanings do they carry. You might have noticed by now that the typical focal point of Hungarian folk art compositions tend to be a tulip resembling flower, kind of forming a perfect symmetrical flower bouquet, right? Now the tulip shape is one of our oldest motifs that historians originate back to ancient tree of life representations. Like in many early cultures around the world, ancient Hungarians used the tree of life as a symbol to illustrate how the world around them has been built up. And how does it work according to their pagan worldview? The core concept is that the trunk of the tree that we see the most, that is life on earth as we know it and live it. The roots that we don't see underground, that's the underworld where foul creatures like worms and such live. And the top of the tree goes up to the high heavens where wonders and fantastic creatures live. And of course in most Hungarian folk tales, only the bravest, most special chosen ones of us get to climb up to, you know, to fight dragons and giants and save the world. Now many ethnographic professors believe that as time went on, Hungarians turned their tree of life compositions into these more floral based bouquet style drawings once they got introduced to tulip flowers, probably from Turkish influence as the Ottoman Empire came and conquered lands all over Europe in the 16th century. In Hungarian folklore, while tulips represent feminine beauty first and foremost, it also has been known as a symbol that keeps evil spirits away. Therefore you would oftentimes find them on carved wooden gates and columns outside of houses. Now going back to the idea of feminine beauty, I feel like I need to clarify something. Here when we say feminine beauty, I feel like I need to clarify that we mean that in every sense of the word. So no, nothing is wrong with you if you think there is something oddly sensual and steamy about this suggestive looking flower motifs that I keep showing to you. The idea of fertility and women's godly power to create life, Mother Earth herself, is being addressed intentionally in some of these illustrations, with a little bit of male symbolism also sprinkled in there sometimes. The very idea to create life itself is a key bit of symbolism that we can't really circle around when we're talking about these symbols and Hungarian illustrations. So yeah, well, if you haven't noticed it before, well, now you will. Certain subcultures within Hungary go even deeper into this metaphor and state how the life cycle of a flower can also be used to draw parallels to the typical life stages of women from birth through initial blooming to the point where in time the flower opens up and branches out, gives life to other flower buds, then with time, at old age, drops all its petals and so the circle of life eventually gets completed. Color can also be a key when decoding these tulip motifs, while red tulip is a sign of passion and sensuality, yellow flowers represent hopeless love and white ones refer to innocence and purity. The system of Hungarian folk art has been built around flowers, floral patterns and motifs in general. And besides the classic tulips, other recognizable flowers can represent other concepts and meanings. Roses, like in many cultures, tend to represent fulfilled love, although perfectly symmetrical, mandala-like rose shapes can also symbolize the sun. Some historians believe that sun worship was also once part of the pagan Hungarian belief system, something that they carried over from eastern influences. Branches of rosemary tends to symbolize the connection between relatives or lovers, and these circular pomegranate shapes tend to represent wealth and prosperity. Pomegranate is not a native fruit to Hungary, therefore it counted as a delicacy in olden times, hence the reference to wealth. In old Hungarian the fruit was also sometimes referred to as golden apple or aranyalma, a word you would oftentimes find in old poems or folk songs. Besides the typical floral compositions, another very typical Hungarian folk art decoration element is the bird. And I'm saying just a bird, because unlike in most other cultures, folklore and traditional symbols, here we don't talk about a very specific breed of bird, like a wise owl of ancient Greece or the majestic ibis from Egypt. Oftentimes you would see very much simplified bird shapes in Hungarian folk-inspired artworks such as these, which could pass as a pigeon, 
sparrow or any other common European bird really. Now the common ethnographic opinion is the reason behind this is because these bird drawings represent all birds, just birds in general. In Hungarian myths and folklore, birds have very special powers and roles. If we circle back to the pagan Hungarian belief system, back to the tree of life motif in which the world has been divided into three main stages, stations, places, birds are the only creatures from our world which have been seemingly blessed with the ability to go and visit the other world, the one above us, to visit heaven, if you will, right? In ancient times we believed that our spiritual leaders or shaman, which we used to call the Tartosh, who was basically this wizard-like figure, he would have the ability to turn into a bird himself, maybe not in body but at least in spirit, in order to gain otherworldly knowledge to see into the future, to fight evil spirits, and most importantly, to be a connection between the real world and the spiritual world. Which again is a common belief in most ancient cultures in and around Asia. But even beyond that, we all know that Native American tribes tend to respect birds as spiritual guiding symbols if you think of the iconic chief headdress. Or if you think of Christianity, the Holy Spirit itself is a concept that we tend to illustrate as a bird, usually a white dove. Isn't it? And of course, like seemingly everything else in this video, birds can also be translated as a symbol of love, especially if there are a pair of them within the composition. Generally speaking, the act of decorating with these folk inspired motifs was quite labor intensive, as they were painted, embroidered, or carved onto your chosen material by hand requiring great deal of time and dedication, and so these artworks were oftentimes put on gifts, offerings, objects which you would prepare for a loved one, someone you deeply cared about. As a sign of affection, men would carve beautiful symbols onto wooden objects, girls would paint these decor elements onto eggs at Easter time, then give them to a boy they fancied. These traditional markings, I think, were really the sign of affection in olden days. This is probably why in the Hungarian language most of our terms of endearment refer to these very same subjects. In Hungary, instead of calling your other half your honey or your darling, you would say things like my flower, my precious rose, my turtle dove, that sort of thing to this day, which is quite telling, I think. Now I know what you are thinking, most of you have probably picked upon how similar all four cards can be, no matter whichever corner of the world you are observing from. I was giving you the Hungarian perspective on folk art, but you can easily get from Eastern Europe through India all the way to Mexico even and find very similar designs in a way. I mean, sometimes it's immensely difficult, borderline impossible to tell Hungarian or any folk art apart from other cultures folk art patterns. And in a way I think that's the beauty of this whole thing, as opposed to fine art where ownership is always priority. In the world of folk art things are accessible to everyone, there is no space for ego or elitism. It truly is the art of the people. Everyone is invited to this party to make something beautiful. And so there are no real barriers of entry of traditional folk art. I like to think that when different cultures meet in this way, we can inspire each other. No one is really losing out on anything. The exchange enriches both sides as we influence one another, building this maybe naive but very beautiful idea that there are no real borders or distances, barriers between any of us, really. Our desire to surround ourselves with beautiful things is a deeply human trait, something we all share. And so I think that these stylized dots and lines and patterns, they are so much more than decoration. In a way they are the language that we all speak in this planet, therefore they have the power to connect all of us, I think. Guys, I really hope that you enjoyed this little cultural rambling. I would love to know what you make of all this, if you can relate to any of these meanings and messages in any way, wherever in the world you are watching this video from. Feel free to let us know if you do with a like or a comment. And well, I hope to see many of you coming back for more videos all about design, decor and other beautiful things that make up our world. Until then, I'm just gonna say bye all. Avis on Ciao!